Okay, everybody. Um, thank you very much for um, signing up for our webinar. Uh, looks like we still have a few more attendees joining, but we can get started. Uh, just a few housekeeping items here. So we always record and provide a recording of the webinar and a PDF of all the slides afterwards. So in a couple of days, you can expect uh, to receive a link to the recording and, and, and the slides as well. Um, the typical webinar length is around one hour. We're gonna have four speakers today, four presenters today. Very fortunate to have them. Sometimes we run a little longer and then we ask that you hold any questions uh, for the end of the webinar and then we'll do our best to answer those. And of course, um, if you can always contact us if we don't get to your question afterwards. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Keith Hayes of Bluefield Research. Keith, are you ready? I am. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to share with the broader community looking at Internet of Things, Bluefield Research's perspective from the water industry. So I'm gonna to touch on today, what's going on with the water sector? How are, how are utilities primarily looking at digital transformation? What are some of the drivers and inhibitors to that? And, and what that could mean to you working in the IoT space. So you've probably seen quotes like this before. This is one that seems particularly apt for the water industry, which is when digital transformation is done right, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But when it's done wrong, all you have is a really fast caterpillar. That's from George Westerman over at MIT. And I think it really tends to capture what we see when you're layering a lot of complexity onto an already complex organization and you might not get all the benefits out of turning dark data into insight and improving operations. So what I'm going to touch on today, four things primarily. First is what is the context for water utilities? So how are they organized? What's their data environment? And secondly, what's their journey towards digital transformation? We see specific steps here in terms of what they're trying to integrate in terms of instrumentation towards getting insight out of their data. Thirdly, the transformation drivers and inhibitors, what's holding that back or not, and, and what does that mean in terms of the opportunity, lastly. So what's going on with water utilities? Similar to other power or transport or other types of public services utilities, water utilities have multiple layers of data that they're working with. We tend to split them into three types of asset management. So you've got your core assets, core assets having to do with SCADA systems, GIS, the inventory of all the pipes, pumping stations, treatment plants that are out there. Then you've got your tactical asset management that's making the operational decisions around when to open and close valves, turn on or off chemical dosing, things like that. Then you've got strategic asset management, which is thinking further out trying to harness predictive analytics, big data to make more important investment decisions. So these three types of asset management occur pulling in data from several relatively disparate silos in the sense that you've got investment planning, IT, customer systems, SCADA and telemetry. And within there, you've got metered data management, which we're gonna talk about more today. And and I'm just trying to let you know that obviously the, the data that's coming into these systems is oftentimes not necessarily being integrated with other operational decisions. You've got several different departments here, from engineering and operations through to finance that are pursuing their own agenda. So it's a relatively complicated environment. Luckily, you know, utilities do tend to prioritize customer facing investments. So investing in metering data and customer information systems are quite core to, you know, revenue capture and keeping things running. So that is a, that's a key part of how utilities are developing. Well, now what that means is that when they are developing their digital transformation strategies, they're usually going through several steps here from first trying to gain situational awareness. So that oftentimes that means putting sensors 
putting data loggers, remote telemetry units, meters out on their network, first of all, to just figure out what's going on. Then second, they're looking to unify that data. So through a SCADA system or other visualization tools, which can help them to make better decisions about maintenance, for instance. And then a third step, which tends to happen further out once they have the data, they've been able to put it into a usable form is trying to do more predictive analytics around it. And so for us, IoT is a core piece of getting started on that journey. And it needs to fit within a broader long-term vision. Otherwise, a lot of that data is just gonna sit there. So what kind of applications are we talking about here when we think about IoT inside a water utility? Obviously there's metering, which you know, doesn't necessarily need to be bi-directional. Um, you need penetration capabilities. You know, the quality of the connectivity is very important as well as the quality of the equipment. We've got SCADA and telemetry, which are mission critical for operating a lot of those core assets I mentioned before. Then you've got those monitoring functions, which are important to make better operational decisions. That could be flow, quality, other parameters. And then you've got commercial and agricultural applications as well here. So what's holding back investing more in IoT within water utilities? A lot of that has to do with people and processes. So this is a survey that we did with SWAN, which is a water industry IoT oriented forum uh, towards the middle of last year, where we took into account a lot of different, a lot of different factors from, you know, is there budget in place? Is there a, a sophisticated IT department? And really what it comes down to is not a lack of data necessarily or technical solutions out there, but really it's having a cultural buy-in and putting in place the processes to make sure that if there is an investment in IoT, it's gonna be harnessed to its best use. So the good news is that getting over some of those barriers seems to be happening, particularly with the pandemic. We've seen that the level of comfort with digital technology has improved. So if you look on the left there before COVID-19, that light blue shade in the middle, say there was somewhat comfortable, the utilities level of comfort with uh, just working remotely, with accessing certain data visualization tools to check on their operations, to now in you know, barely a year, this is looking more promising in terms of more staff getting more comfortable, a lot of training being conducted, getting experience with VPNs, with some of the basics that, you know, probably a lot of you working in the telecoms industry are maybe very familiar with, but not necessarily at a public water utility. So if we look at this next slide, what that means is that we are anticipating a pretty steady ramp up of investment in smart water technology, including meters. And metering and customer management are a big chunk of the market. So this is just the US. We're anticipating over $40 billion worth of investment just in metering and customer management alone between uh, now and 2030. And that's followed by a lot of the software tools that make use of that data. So network management, work and asset management, plant management. Now, obviously a key driver around that is what is the business case for adopting these technologies? So let's assume that you do have a, an internal culture that is proactively trying to build out a digital transformation strategy. Let's assume that there is the willingness to start investing in some instrumentation, but really to get a lot of those decisions approved, you have to show the business case. And the business case for IoT, it's multifaceted. We tend to look at it a lot in terms of the OPEX savings across a lot of these different functional silos in a water utility. So that could be systems oper operations optimizations. So for instance, programming pumps to pump at an optimal time using uh, remote controls that 
can reduce your energy costs. So that's over 19 billion in savings over 10 years potentially in the US. Workforce management is another huge area where understanding when it makes the most sense to move your, your maintenance crews or not, and how to leverage that maintenance data to make better decisions going forward, which feeds into the predictive analytics and asset management. So that's almost 6 billion worth of savings. And then you've got chemicals and how uh, dosing and procurement of chemicals could be optimized. So several areas here where IoT comes into play in making better operational decisions that result in significant savings. So if we think about that across the telco space at Bluefield Research, we have spent time over the last three to four years looking at what's happening here in terms of, first of all, utilities starting to adopt a particular telecoms protocol or not, whether it was using Sigfox or Loreland or NB, NBIoT in urban. Mm -hmm. And what's been interesting is to see first for us, the level of focus on water. So that's that Y axis there, the solution source. So is water being added to obviously a portfolio of different utility solutions? And there's not much specificity in terms of the complexity of let's say underground assets versus the telecoms operators that have been diversifying a lot more. There's a bit of a one size fits all more approach to try and cover all different types of applications. So that's our Y axis there. And then if you think about the X axis, how are they coming to the market? Is it a very direct approach? So really trying to engage with the utilities and improve the way that they can perhaps migrate from a patchwork of different protocols and cabled solutions to using their networks versus a partnership approach here where you know, it, it, it's much more working through local integrators. And I think the takeaway from us right now, we don't have a clear groupings necessarily in the, in the, uh, in these quadrants. I think that it's, it's a bit all over the place. It does seem that it is early days as a lot of pilots are happening out there. And so uh, I think primarily, you know, some of the larger players like uh, at t or NTT Docomo have been working through partnerships and, and adding it. Uh, we have seen a lot more specificity, uh, particularly in Australia with Telstra, um, but also with Vodafone uh, and also Telefonica in terms of announcing uh, projects and solutions that are more specific to the water industry, which is important in water utilities gaining confidence that they're gonna be responsive to their needs. So, now that's playing out in several different markets. And what we do at Bluefield Research, we're trying to track a lot of important deployments, whether or not they're on the cutting edge of you know, advanced metering infrastructure, that can vary a lot. I think it is a, a big deal though, that we are starting to see a move towards AMI um, across multiple regions. So you know, some key deals we've had our eyes on over the last year and a half, the deal with that uh, with uh, the PUB in Singapore, um, over 300,000 meters being deployed, which is huge for Singapore, which is very water water stress dependent on Malaysia for a lot of its water. Really trying to tighten their production of non-revenue water, so that's water being lost or not being properly metered. In the U.S., a few very large deals here um, in Austin in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, um, and in the city of Oceanside, where we've got you know, tens of thousands of meters being rolled out. They're a key piece to these utilities, getting a better whole handle on their billing systems and being able to track more consumption. And I think the next step will be, what can they do? What else can they do with that data? Some other important markets we've seen here with some developments uh, in South Africa, a small municipality doing more of a pilot here, but bringing in Vodacom, EMS, Honeywell, uh, which we think is promising in terms of seeing rollout of NBIOT. 
with a couple hundred meters. Uh, and then also um, a couple other deals here, Sweden. I'm not sure, but we may have lost our panelist here. Let's wait uh, a second and see if he comes back here. So uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I interrupt Tim to, to let us participate in this uh, webinar. And where we will share from the telephonic view what are the main challenge and opportunities for the smart metering market. First of all, who we are? We are now Telefonica Tech. Telefonica Tech is um, a newly created company that gathers all the B2B business in on three different verticals, which are cloud, cybersecurity, and IoT big data. Okay, so we, we have uh, five big markets. As we belong to Telefonica. We are Telefonica. Uh, this is Spain, Germany, UK, Brazil, Eastman. Okay. Um, from the IoT side, we have been today, today we have been awarded for the seventh year as leaders in the magic quadrant of uh, for Gardner of uh, IoT managed services. And uh, yes, just you to know who, who we are. We are in, in Telefonica, but now we are Telefonica Tech. And, and for now, I, I would like to explain how the cellular connectivity fulfills the most of the requirements that the smart metering market uh, have to with, with this technology. Um, as a short story, let me introduce you what is 2G and 3G, sure we know it. Um, and with uh, 2G and 3G, we, we used to solve the, the, the IoT problem when it was called M2M, but uh, since LTM and Norban IoT appeared, now most of the use cases that were solved using 2G and 3G can be solved using Norban or LTM, for example, the, the use cases that were uh, based on battery, now they are they perfectly fit on, on narrow band. And the one that were not uh, ATIC or you need a voice, you can you can use LTM. So so these uh, legacy technologies uh, will be substituted with narrow band IoT and LTM soon. Okay, and. What are the, the main challenge we have in, 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 uh, as a device point of view and uh, the network um, operator point of view? Mm, the biggest one I think is battery. You need to, the battery of your device should last for at least the same lifetime of your device. And most of the uh, smart metering devices, uh, they are they are kind of sealed. So you won't, you will not want to change the battery or refurbish the device uh, many times, isn't it? So it is uh, key to, 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 do, to spend the, the battery correctly and not to spill energy. Coverage, the, the issues cases, the, the, the place where the meters are uh, set, they are kind of hidden, they are not so visible. So, uh, you should select a network that can reach really low levels of battery of coverage. Okay. Um, network optimization. Um, this is this is really important. So because uh, these these solutions push the technology to the limit. So you want to spend the less battery you want, you want to reach the, the, the deepest coverage you want, but you can uh, you uh, only be able to do this with a really strong network optimization team and process, okay? And as well, it, it, these, these use cases, as they are massive, you won't, will not want to uh, do um, the operation and maintenance of, of this uh, uh, 
of these small metering solutions uh, one by one. I mean, the device one by one. You, you will need to do massive task of maintenance, peer work, um, et cetera, um, because if not, it won't, it won't be, it won't scale at all. So you will need to do the best management and, and the security as a transversal problem that all the IoT solution should solve correctly. Okay. So now that the challenges are identified, I, I will uh, explain shortly uh, what are the main capabilities of the Narvan IoT, which is the, the, the perfect uh, cellular connectivity solution network that fits the into the smart metering scenario. Here, I, I show you in yellow the state machine of a typical Narvan IoT uh, connection. So the device can be powered off, connected, idle, waiting for something uh, to receive some message or, or, or in PCM. The, the, um, this PCM status is new. Uh, new. I mean, it was new, but let me explain that uh, usually when you were using 2G, you used to attach and detach from the network. So you attach the network, transmit the data, detach from the network, and turn off the communication module. But from now on, using Urban IoT, you can use PSM uh, mode to avoid to spill energy because coming back from PSM to idle, you spend much less energy than turning on and off the communication module. So PSM is a, a really, really good approach if you want to use a solar network and uh, save energy. Another functionality, which is critical on this extended coverage. In Narvati, in Arvon IoT, uh, has been defined three level of coverage, uh, zero, zero to two. And these, these uh, levels are based on, on repetition, just repetition. The, yeah, you can see the level zero, where the, this time on the battery. Uh, it's not so much time that is needed to transmit the data, but when in ECL2, where you can go till 164 dBs of MCL, um, the network and the device repeats the message continuously to uh, assure that is it can go from the device to the network or backwards. Okay, so it's really important to 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 know that. With Narvan IoT, you can reach almost every place. Then those two capabilities, I, I could talk about this a lot, but those are the main, most important ones, Narvan IoT and standard coverage to, to fulfill uh, the smart metering. Uh, additional to this, Telefonica has uh, provided additional capabilities for the, to the, the network. Which is um, we have deployed Narvan IoT and LTM. Okay, you can use LTM as a backup or, or for different use cases. We also support the SMS over Narvan IoT and LTM. Um, as I said uh, some slides ago, these devices are mostly sealed. So imagine that if in the lifetime of your or your device, sadly, you want to change to one network operator to another. So we provide the GSMA UVCC remote provisioning, for SIM swap, that you can use to change from one network operator to other uh, without having to refurbish the device, okay? Then for a massive task or maintenance or, um, managing the life cycle of the SIM cards, uh, alarming system and security, we have the Kite platform. With the Kite platform, you can do massive operations of these solutions without I mean, uh, being really efficient. And then we are working on the new capabilities. Uh, I mean, new, it was new in the past, release 14 of 3PP is not so, so new, but we are uh, working on deploying new release 14 capabilities in terms of uh, 
enhances the throughput and having less battery consumption, and, and it's much more to come. And I would like you to know what is our the things lab, which is the, the engine that we put in the IoT ecosystem to um, to help uh, our partners on how to create more uh, IoT solution faster. Okay, so in the things lab we. We run the seen the things lab since last I think four years maybe. Uh, we have played with uh, with the chips of manufacturers, module manufacturers, device makers, platform providers. We have tested uh, end-to-end solutions. So this is the way we play in the in the IoT ecosystem with this uh, lab. We we can help uh, really different size of partners on, on how to um, develop their solutions so um, it, it's it's uh, it's been a really good experience for us and for the our partners and um, after after uh, selecting a, a connectivity you should select the the next uh, layer of the of the oc protocol stack so you based on the 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 capabilities of your network latest in throughput you should select a protocol that should be resilient to these uh, characteristics timeouts retransmission you also use you should like between udp tcp and idt which is a uh, transporting data without any ip layer you can do this using normal cmlcm and you should select a, a protocol that can be proprietary or a standard one like MQTT, MQTT SN, Co-op, Laguna to m to do them the most important part of the of the, the solution with this, which is extracting data from the meters uh, and manage, manage the devices. Okay, so it's it's key to select the right protocol if you want to save the energy and so on, as I said. What do we do in Telefonica to, to be sure that we have a, build a, a correct solution that we have a select a, 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 the correct partner to work with? So we have this full path of testing from remote test to final end-to-end -end test. So we can test the devices remotely, or you can come to the lab and we help you test it. We have different services, so pre-test or the official telephonic certification uh, to assure that the solution that you have built fulfill perfectly the requirements of your clients and ours. Okay. So uh, when when a solution came out from Telefonica, it is it's been completely tested. And then how this flow through the through, through time? As we have deployed several, uh, we have done several deployments on urban IoT, or smart lighting, uh, smart metering. Uh, we are continually, continuously learning what uh, have been the problem that we have saw in, in real deployment. And with the solution, we go back to the development part of the future solutions. So we are, I mean, more efficient in terms of uh, the solution of the future when we have the problem of the past solution. Okay, so we do this continuously and it works great. And what's our, what are our approach in, in the metering, in the metering business? We we have we have uh, built an end-to-end -end solution with different type of devices, gas meters, water meter, electricity meters, and we have uh, done an, an integration between these devices uh, and a platform. And with the kite platform, I have uh, I have described uh, before. So and um, it's kind of 
a turnkey project. Okay, so Telefonica can provide an end-to-end -end solution to the to the utility. And why do we do this as we are Telefonica? Because we have we came up that uh, with the conclusion that you cannot build massive IoT solution for smart metering if you are a little to large utility because the relationship between the device and the network is so close that you need to build partnership more than uh, buying different, buying connectivity, buying separately devices, integrate to, through a platform. So this type of, of solution, you need to buy the whole thing working together uh, if you want to be successful on this. Okay. So this is it from my side. Um, I don't know exactly okay. what's going oh, to continue. Uh, Keith, is, Keith is back or not? Yeah, Keith is back. So thank you, Nicola. And we'll let Keith uh, wrap up his presentation and then I'll take it from there. Great. Uh, many apologies to all of you. I was not anticipating to have that drop off there, obviously. Um, so, be able to see my screen now? Yeah, we're all good. You're not in presentation mode, but that's fine. Okay. So, um, yeah, as I was as I was saying uh, previously, we are tracking several different projects uh, around the world, and I think you know a lot of the procurement factors that. Uh, Nicola was mentioning are very important in terms of connectivity, that device integration. Those are all feeding into how these uh, tech providers have been selected and their important showcase projects for driving ahead the, the industry. So you caught me right at the end of the presentation here when I dropped off. So I, I think I just wanted to give you guys the, the takeaways from our Keith, point of view. Keith? Yes. There's something going on with your presentation. We can't see your full presentation. Can you try and change the mode and see if we can go to full mode or see what see if we can do something? Okay, is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so just wrapping up here, you know, from the the point of view of the water industry that we've been analyzing, the the pandemic and longer con term concerns about uh, resilience. So uh, dealing with drought, dealing with stormwater management, all of that is driving greater adoption of IoT solutions. And you know, it's, it's feeding into how they're considering their, the weak spots on their network, where they need to add more connectivity that's gonna help them make operational decisions. Smart metering, it's, it's core to that longer term planning. And what we mean by that is you know, when it touches on finance, customer management, um, the use of water resource itself. It is a key focus of digital transformation and we think it's gonna be probably uh, over 40% of the market value, at least in the US, in terms of the savings generated by, um, in, in terms of OPEX and also in terms of CAPEX. And lastly, from our perspective, telecom and connectivity providers they do seem to be focusing more and more, as Nicola mentioned, on adding water and water specific devices to their portfolio to meet uh, that demand that is unique to, to the assets that are being connected in the, in the water industry. So that's all, that's all I had. I wanted to thank you guys for your attention and, and look forward to the Q&A. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll take it from here. Good. So um, again, everybody, um, first off, my name is Stephen Lurie. I'm the digital marketing manager here at IOTRAP. And uh, before I start uh, and go into the, the meat of my presentation, just a few words about IOTRAP. So if you're not familiar with IOTRAP, we're very focused on efficiency and standards. Um, we're very different from a lot of people in the IoT space in that 
Uh, many people really started with a focus on the cloud. Um, IHRP is a little bit different in that we really started by focusing on the device. Um, you know, there's going to be millions, potentially billions of these devices out there. Uh, and if you can imagine, this chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So we thought it was really important that the devices themselves had very robust, compact, standardized services. And so that's a, an important strength on our part. And it's been why we've been able to work with uh, different important companies in the smart metering space like iTron, EDMI, and others. Um, and it's also helped us get some really interesting experiences in this marketplace. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that more as we go on. Um, you know, it's smart metering, if you, you've studied this space at all, or if you've been around it for a while, it started in electricity and then it moved out into gas and water and other industries. And I think that's what's so exciting about it because it has this potential to drive so much efficiency in what are really the basic services we use in our life. Um, and it's also really interesting working with people in the space who have already deployed these solutions. Uh, in our previous webinar, which I provide a link to at the end of this webinar, um, we worked with David Rowe of EDMI. Uh, and he you know, clearly states, he says, you know, the, the ROI, the return on, on smart meeting has always been clear. It's just been technically, it's been very difficult to do and the costs have been too high. Um, and so that's the great part is as, as the technology is maturing, uh, we're getting better at, at, at controlling the cost. Um, but it's also a real challenge for a lot of companies because as, as Keith was saying, it's like lack of knowledge in the companies and the culture. And so the issue is less and less the technology and is, is more and more the culture. It's understanding how this fits. How does all these protocols, how does IoT become business? Um, and that's the real question. And so um, we're working with that, but our focus is more on the IoT and the protocol side. Um, I think what's interesting is that there's a real evolution of these solutions. So, um, you know, early on, these solutions really focused on solving one problem. For the most part, it was capturing metering data uh, and reporting that, and it solved a billing problem and reduced operational cost. Um, but these weren't real IoT solutions. They were more embedded solutions or M2M. And what we're seeing is that we're really moving towards IoT, um, and it's data that's driving these, this evolution here. So, um, you know, data is what's powering the modern economy and people want access to this. And so that's why we're kind of moving to this. And that's, that's what makes standardization also so important, which is, you know, how can we help reduce the cost here? Um, but there's a real challenge here because connecting many, many, many devices to the internet, to the cloud is not easy. Um, this needs to be done in kind of an orchestrated, synchronized part away. You have disparate pieces. You have the devices, you have the network, and you have the cloud. And these things were not really designed to work well to each other. And so that's kind of the pieces we've been working on to figure out. Um, and I think, you know, when you when you talk with people like, for example, like Telefonica and, and our customers, you know, the battery is really important and the optimization is really important. And those things happen on the device, on the device management side, and they happen on the network side. I think on the network something, there's something like 160 different little parameters you can move around on NB-IoT to optimize the device. So you need a lot of experience really to, to do that well uh, and quickly as well. Um, so let's look at what early solutions looked like. So this is kind of simplified, but I think 1.0 is the key term here because if we're really talking about this solved one problem, usually supported one device, had one network and one application server or front end. And this was great. This was cutting edge for the time. Um, but today, the way we understand it, it's, it's, it's just too limited. And, and one of the biggest limited limits, and, and Kate touched on this as well, is that the data is siloed. Uh, and so there's so much value in the data. Uh, and so at if one level, you want to get the data so you can improve operations. Then you want to extend the data throughout your enterprise. And then actually there's benefits to potentially extending the data beyond that. I mean, there's going to be innovation and other things that happen when you extend that data outside of that. And when you look at something like water, there's even an interest to extend the data out so that we have better data on what's happening worldwide with, with important resources like water. Um, and um, so, and what we're seeing with our customers is that they really see that this is just too limiting and too brittle. The people that have done this, for example, uh, iTron, uh, EDMI, they don't want any part of this going forward. Uh, and they want to build something that's much more open really focuses on reducing the cost of building these solutions. 
And that looks something more like this. Um, and so this is more of a standardized infrastructure. So you can see the pieces that you used to have to do, which is the whole application, the whole backend, and, and managing the network as well. Now, those are all provided. So all that plumbing there is provided, and you can really just focus on the application layer of, of whatever your solution is. You can support you know, multiple different meridian solutions throughout your co company. So you know, wherever you're, it's touching your operations, you can do that. Um, and then you can tie it into different application servers on the back end. So in the case of what Keith mentioned, that could be SCADA, that could be you know, any one of a number of systems, your ERP, your billing system, what have you. Um, and of course, uh, everything is standardized. So for example, in one, you know, one region, you may be running one management system in another region, another. So again, managed and flexible. Um, and this is a really like this structure now is, is really considered foundational for mature IoT strategies. And part of this, again, I mentioned standardized and that's lightweight end to M. And why lightweight end to end? So it's it's really interesting. Um, Gartner said initially that lightweight end to end. They said this actually uh, a few months back uh, that lightweight end to end rationalizes uh, IoT developer OEMs. And of course they're right. But I think one of the things they really missed out on and, and missed missed the point on is that lightweight end to end and these device management services are really key to controlling the operational cost. If you haven't thought about all of these things beforehand. Um, you're really going to get into trouble very quickly. You, you just can't maintain your costs. And, and also, not only do they have to be done, but they have to be done well, really well. Doing them poorly uh, increases security risk and a lot of other issues. And then finally, of course, all this because it's based on the standard. Um, you want to use one backend or change backends or add a new device. A lot of flexibility there, which is really important going forward. Uh, and so it can support different use models and it can support different business models. And, and these are really key things because again, smart metering, yeah, it's about IoT, but it's about business. People want reassurance as they're investing these important amounts of capital that what they're doing is going to stay relevant and they're gonna be able to manage this going not five years, not 10 years, but 20 years. We're talking about decades. This is gonna be build, deploy and manage over a long time. And that, that ties back to the network as well. So increasingly, uh, the network before was something that, that many people who operated these solutions operated themselves, but the role is changing. Um, this is seen as a foundational piece, but you know, a, a piece that could be operated independently. And there's a lot of business interest to do that. So increasingly, this means cellular for many of our customers. Uh, and the reason why is one, there's quality of service issues. Um, there's solution fit, NBIoT for these smart metering, MMTC or massive solutions as, as Nicola mentioned them, um, fits really well. There's global product is a global product strategy issues. So you know you can build a single solution and deploy it anywhere in the world. Uh, and so that's very important. Uh, something that uh, actually David Howard of iTron mentioned, which is, he said that you know NBIoT makes it easier to do proofs of concept. That the cost you don't have to deploy any infrastructure to do proof of concept, so you can gauge easier. Um, and so that's a real business advantage as well. Um, and then finally, there's just the hassle of managing the networks. If you don't have to manage this network, you don't really want to. And I think the other thing that people are increasingly our customers are aware of is that there's a lot of hidden costs to managing your own network. So there's legal, there's administrative fees. So you have, have the actual operating costs, but then the real costs are kind of different about that. And of course, there's kind of reinsurance. You know, reassurance, you know that it's going to be there for the decades to come, which is, which is kind of key. Um, I mentioned development earlier. Uh, so on, on the development side, uh, you know, and I mentioned Gartner that they said that this is a rational approach for OEMs uh, to do that. Um, again, um, this is really about focus and abstraction. Uh, I've worked you know, with telecoms or I've spoken with telecoms and our customers and uh, IoT development can be very complicated. There's a lot of intricacies to each network and to each device. For example, different device manufacturers are gonna have different software stacks. It's a lot to know about each little device. So what, what people really wanna do is just focus on the application layer um, and 
and not have to know each device and have services available that are standardized and easy to understand and that you can reuse. Um, David Howard, again, who's on the call on one of the previous webinars he did with us said, you know, they want standardized infrastructure from device to cloud. Um, and they don't want to build everything. They want to let other people, you know, build part of it and then uh, let other people innovate and build solutions. Um, and that's kind of helps them get there. Um, I think just on the development side, you know, I talked about this is challenging to do and this is some of the complexity. So again, Nicola, he mentioned the protocols. So you need to use the right protocol depending on what kind of what network you're using. There's also a not, lot of network latency issues. It's, it's interesting when you go on the developer boards to see people are saying, you know, my, my solution is timing out. I can't get the server to respond. Um, there's a lot of optimization there, especially for battery life, but also you don't want too much data going over the network and you don't want to needlessly use uh, server resources either. Um, photo or firmware up updates, of course you want to do this efficiently, but you know, uh, a lot of people say they do photo, but um, if you do photo wrong, and photo is increasingly, um, you know, governments are increasingly adding this to regulations, it's becoming necessary. But if you do it wrong, you actually increase um, security risk on your solution. Uh, it could be exposing your, your, your operations, um, which is kind of a dangerous. Security. Security is very challenging in IoT. It's a really a different paradigm than what we saw in IT where everything is very extensible and you kind of have this fortress mentality. Of course here, everything's extended and you're dealing with a lot of constraints. And one of the biggest constraints of course in, in smart metering is gonna be energy. Um, and so you need an approach to right size this. Um, I didn't put the link in here, but we recently just finished a, a white paper on Oscor. Uh, very detailed and Oscor, if you haven't heard of it, it's, it's a protocol, it's an IoT, or it's a protocol for security that's specific to IoT, a little bit like CoAP. Um, and what's interesting is that it does some very interesting things from as far as security perspective end to end, but also can help save energy uh, and combined with some other approaches can, can really get to the, the most efficient uh, energy or solutions as far as energy efficiency point of view. Um, and finally, data. Like, there's a lot of uh, interesting things here. So there's a lot of standardization efforts here. So there's no reason to create your own data format um, each time. You can standardize the data formats, and you can create the applications more quickly. Um, you get the interoperability benefits, and also you're able to share the data more quickly. So just wanted to go into some of those. And what's really funny about this is, oftentimes when we talk with people, they're like, "Oh, I, I can do this." Um, you kind of get this not invented here thing. Oh, we can do this, we can do this. And our biggest customers, yeah, they can do this and they don't want to do this. They're, they don't want to tangle with this anymore. They just rather have, have someone else do this, take a standardized approach, kind of similarly to what you would do if you had a web server or you're building infrastructure in the cloud. I, I've yet to meet anybody who's built their own web server. You just download something and, and build your application on top of that. And same goes with cloud. No one builds their own cloud. You just use what's available to you and build your infrastructure on that. And that's the same logic. And it's very long-term strategic logic about this. Um, and of course, lightweight end-to-end, -end, you know, there's the front end and there's the back end. So you have the application, which you're developing, um, and then you have the platform. Um, and so I, I call this any. And so, you know, people want the flexibility. They want to know that their device can work on any lightweight end-to-end -end platform. They want to know that they can tie into any application server, tie into any network, and support any device. Um, and who wouldn't want that? Uh, and then, of course, this needs to be scalable and optimized from device to cloud. And that's another thing. Um, I was talking about application development earlier and the NIH syndrome where people are like, oh, I can build this. That's the same thing. If you think with... Um, just a, a small team, you're gonna build really scalable, optimized architecture for massive IoT from device to the cloud. Maybe, but um, you know, we're interested in hiring some of those people if they're available. So they're, they're very impressive. And then, and then finally, um, and of course, we also need to be able to monetize it too. So uh, you want infrastructure that's adapted to your business model. So in some cases you're selling direct, some cases you're selling indirect, uh, you want to white box it. So you need to make sure that that infrastructure is really optimized for that. Um, and so that's a good point. And there's that, that quote 
uh, from uh, David Howard in there. So what does this mean to our customers? Well, um, unfortunately, I can't put all our customers in here. Um, that's too bad. It's frustrating for a marketing person. Uh, in the case of Elvaco, we started, and, and they're going to be speaking here in a minute, we started working with Elvaco early in 2020. And after a couple months, uh, they were able to very quickly build a smart mirroring module for, I guess it works up the line to scare heat meter. And thanks to a great product strategy and a little bit, I think COVID as well, they're sold out, um, but they are very happy with it. They're happy with their partnership with us. They're happy with the, with the, with Iowa that we provided them. And so much so that they're, they're working on other NVIOT products. And of course, NVIOT gets them into global markets. Um, and so there's less, customization or personalization for each network that needs to be done uh, as opposed to, to what cellular is able to offer. Um, another one, uh, EDMI. So I embedded the video here. You should have access to this. So they're working with us to smart metering. Oh, I should add uh, previously on the former slide there with um, Elvaco, they actually tried to build a lot of that infrastructure uh, and then just kind of in the end said, you know, this doesn't make much sense. We're not an infrastructure company. We'd rather work with IOTRAP and, and use their toolkits. And so we have two profiles. We have people that try and do it and come to us, or we have people that have done it and now want a new way to do it because they realize that's not the path forward. And that's the case of EDMI. So EDMI is of course experiment experience in this embedded M2M uh, marketplace and has built smart metering solutions before, but they see the path forward as lightweight M2M. And they did analysis of the market and came up with us um, and have been very happy. And uh, there's a, you can watch the video to learn more about that. Um, and of course, uh, they're in, they're very active in APAC region and in Australia, they're expecting something like 10 million smart water meters in the next few years to be deployed there. And guess what? They're all gonna be standardized on lightweight M to M and MBIOT. And the reason why it's not complicated, it's cost, it's business, it just makes sense. Um, and so, um, and David is a really interesting guy because he's deployed LoRa on networks and he's he's used all this different infrastructure. And he's just like, yeah, it's great, but who, who wants the hassle? Um, this gets us where we need to be and we have predict predictable cost and quality of service. So why don't we want to do that? Um, so why IOTRUP? Uh, really quickly, um, you know, I think it's a vision. We've been a part of uh, the Open Mobile Alliance since the beginning. We're currently board member at the SpecWorks at Open Mobile, Open Mobile Alliance. It's IoT strategy in a box. We've already built these pieces. Um, if you want to eliminate these big four words down here, if you want to, if you want to make sure that you can build high quality solutions uh, and and get really high quality uh, infrastructure, reduce your time to market and reduce risk, we're we're the answer for you. Um, and then finally, increasingly, we're an experienced partner. We've worked on these solutions with different people. So we understand the bulk of the issues on here. Now, I don't think there's very few people who understand all the issues, but we understand a good part of them and, and can certainly risk it. And it's, it's, it's a little challenging. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna pass it on to David Svensson now. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Lurie. We have an upcoming webinar with Amazon Web Services. We're gonna be talking about moving data to. AWS IoT Core, you can sign up with that with that link. And we'll also include the link when we set out all the assets. And I also provided links to um, our past smart metering webinar, which I think is really interesting where you can listen to David Rowe on there. Uh, very interesting person uh, and a lot of experience. And then also a link to our other webinars. Um, again, thank you very much. And with that, David, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, you see my screen? Perfect. Uh, thank you, Keith, Nicholas, and Steve for great presentations. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Svensson, and I work as product manager for sensors and uh, meters at the Elvaco. I will take over from here and uh, look a bit deeper into Elvaco, our uh, narrowband IT solution I offer, our product strategy, and uh, the challenges that we have faced within Narban IT. And I have to admit that uh, back at the time when we started to work with the Narban IT technology, 
I would never have guessed how fast the market was going to pick it up. So um, I'm very happy to be here today and to see this big interest in Narbon IT and uh, the smart metering application. So here is the agenda of uh, my presentation. Uh, and uh, to start with, I will give you a brief presentation of Elvaco in general for those of you who are not uh, so familiar with us. And maybe more interesting, I will also try to share some of our thinking around Narbon IT solutions for smart metering applications. Okay, um, some dry facts about Elvaco. We are a Swedish company with about 60 employees with uh, a quite strong international footprint. We have a business worldwide, although we are naturally centered around the European and Nordic markets. And also a quick mentioning, we are a part of a group of companies working with the different aspects of energy efficiency called BEMSIC. And at the top of that, our owner is one of Sweden's largest private investment companies, Latour, which is a typical long-term industrial owner. So if we have a quick look of what we work with and what has been done over time, we have about 30 years of history in developing connectivity solutions for the utility and building markets. And I would almost like to say that we have been in the IoT space long before it was even called IoT. Um, and the overall responsibility and customer adoption are two of our main strengths in an industry where many players are on the same technical level. If you look at our technology portfolio, it is quite broad. This is because we see ourselves as a solution provider rather than a tech company, which means that we employ technologies that we think are useful for building good solutions rather than centering around one particular technology. So basically, Elvaco provides end-to-end -end solutions for connected meters and sensors making data accessible and usable, and we are mainly targeting the smart utility and the smart building markets. At Voco, we say that we are technology agnostics, and this is something that we are quite proud of. And this means that we can deliver the right offer to the right customer and the right application. What we mean when we say that we are technology agnostics is that we work with several different technologies and are not tied to any specific technology. At Elvaco, we are impartial in the use of different technologies to solve different problems. We do not believe that there is a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, so we always try to find the best solution for a given project or application. Uh, and some of, the, some of the technologies we work with are LoRaWAN, Embus, Wireless Embus, 4GLT, and of course, Narrowband IT. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking in this webinar. An important part for Elvaco is the great collaboration with our international partners, which means that we can create powerful customer offerings, both nationally in Sweden and internationally. We do not need to present all of them, but Lannis & Gyr, Deal Metering, Itron, Kamstrup, Engelman, they are all examples of large and successful metering companies where we have recently intensified the partnership to develop meter communication modules for Internet of Things technologies such as Narvan IT and LoRaWAN. This partnership will continue to produce even more meter communication modules within both Narvan IoT and LoRaWAN, so stay tuned. Okay, that was some background facts uh, of, uh, to Elvaco as a company. Now let's have a look at our Narvan IT solution and what choices we have made uh, for this technology. So all Elvaco Narrowband IT products can be integrated with a meter data management server and a device management server. The typical setup is illustrated in this picture. We got device management via lightweight m 2 and we got meter data transport via MQTT SM and also Elvaco to c uh, including the mobile app for assigning ownership of devices and configure products in field. As a customer, you can choose whether you want to create your own solutions for device management and meet the data management, or buy total or parts of the Elvaco solutions. 
it is possible to customize. So this architecture contributes to a flexible and global product strategy. Now let's have a look uh, into some of the parts in this architecture a bit closer. We start with um, the, meter, uh, the device management, sorry, device management. And as I said on the previous slide, uh, a lot of uses lightweight M2M for device management within our IT. And I would say that lightweight M2M is actually the response to a market demand for a common standard for remote management of low energy devices in, in a variety of networks, um, which is necessary to, to actually realize the potential of uh, IoT. So from an Elvaco perspective, Lightweight M2M is a protocol or standard which enables configuration and monitoring of an Elvaco IoT product remotely. This includes setting configuration parameters, update the firmware and trigger momentaneous or historical readouts which are all really important for our customers. Um, and just a quick mentioning about the bootstrap server, which you see to the left. Uh, the bootstrap server is the part of the device management system that is responsible for assigning keys and IP addresses to the module uh, or device. When activated, the device will uh, connect to the bootstrap server to receive security context and IP addresses to the device management server and the metadata server, but I will come back to that a bit later. Okay, and then we have the metadata management server and the metadata management server will receive all the metadata sent from, from the module uh, and the metadata transport is via MQTTSN. MQTTSN stands for MQTT for sensor networks, which just like Lightweight M2M can be seen as a standard it is designed as far as possible uh, to work in the same way as MQTT, but MQTT-SN is better adapted uh, to low power battery operated devices with limited storage, limited payload size, and not always on uh, sleeping. Maybe the biggest difference um, between MQTT and MQTT-SN is removing the, the need for a permanent connection by using UDP for data transport instead of TCP. Okay, uh, let's have a look at how uh, it works when, when, uh, when you start up uh, an Elvaco Narbonati device. So each device has a security ship where a device unique set of keys are stored. These are provisioned in the, to the module during production. So step one is that pre-shared keys of the device is claimed via Elvaco to see web interface and added to uh, the MQTTSN gateway. And then step two, upon activation, the module will attempt to connect to its uh, pre-configured lightweight and term bootstrap server to receive the DTLS pre-shared keys and to receive IP addresses to the DM and MDM server. Step three is that the device connects to the uh, device management server to generate the session key used for device management encryption. And step four is that the module will thereafter connect to do the MQTTSN gateway to do the same thing, to generate the session key used to encrypt the metadata transport. And finally, step five, now the device is up and running and receives commands from a device management server and sends metadata to the MQTTSN gateway. Okay. Um, Finally, I want to share some of our lessons learned and challenges that we have faced when it comes to Narbonne IT. And the first thing, uh, and one of the most important lessons I want to share is that there is a need for a good cooperation between us, Avaco, and the network provider to optimize the device's behavior in the network. And this is just like Nicola said before, um, now, we at Alvaco have experienced that there is a lot of technical details and parameters, parameters that can be adjusted. And depending on these adjustments, the device will make a good or not so good job. So it really is, uh, there really is a need for a good relation and cooperation with the network provider. Um, this is really essential. And, and this is something that we uh, really do at Alvaco. Uh, and we have also faced the challenge regarding the balance between function 
uh, of features in a product and the power consumption. And of course, it is, it is important to make the right trade-off for the right application here. And as always, listen to the market and the customers. What is a must-have feature and what is a nice-to-have feature? Uh, regarding the architectural choices of Narumana T, we feel that we have found a good solution, much because of the we have chosen solutions like, like with Lightweight M2M and MQTT SN that are considered as a standard, which provides a high quality, reliability, and it makes our customers comfortable as well. And thanks to the device management solution from IT Europe, um, we at Alvaco were able to to focus on our core areas and speed up the time to market. And we had also had a really easy and in quick implementation of IT or IOVA, uh, thanks to good documentation and, and support. And yeah, we are satisfied with IT Europe as a partner since they are really experienced and have a good solution with, with the great features. And the last thing that I want to share with you is our products uh, that we can offer within our IT. At the moment, we only have our uh, CMI 6110, which is a communication module for Lannis and Gear heat meter. Um, with firmware, uh, firmware of the update over the air, different message format and trigger readouts and, and retries. And this, as Steve mentioned before, this product has been a huge success for us. Uh, and we also have ongoing development for an iTron heat meter, uh, our CMI 6130. And we have even more products in development ongoing, but nothing that I can uh, share with you today. And yeah, we have a high speed in development of both Narvana T and Loravan products. So you will see even more of these local products in the future. And that's it from, from my side. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, I'll go back to my... Uh presentation here, um, maybe, yep, it's on here, uh, there we go, again, uh, well, first of all, let me thank all of our, our panelists uh, for, for participating today, this is great, and, and thank everybody for attending. Uh, this is the part where we do um, question and answers. Uh, so I'm going to look at the Q&A. Um, there was one question just really quickly. Uh, someone asked, can we use um, smart meters for leakage detention and how? And absolutely, this is absolutely a perfect thing for this. Um, something I failed to mention here is that many of the data objects, the data models for this have already been defined. Uh, so in lightweight M2M, -M, there's something like 56 data models around smart water metering alone. Uh, many of those have been defined by Southeast Water Corporation. Um, and so one of them is pressure, um, but there's many others that are related to leakage, but essentially um, using different data points uh, on your network, you're able to very quickly detect water leakage and water leakage is a huge issue. I think um, Keith is better positioned to speak about this, but this is a huge issue. I think depending on the, on the country, uh, like I think one fifth of the water is lost, just being distributed. Um, so it's a big problem. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, here's, uh, okay. Okay, there was a question here also from Andy, uh, for water meridian, how would you compare the technical advantages of uh, NBIOT versus LTM? Uh, and does LTM provide a viable alternative in your opinion? Um, so, you know, for water metering, the, the key th application criterion is often uh, energy. Uh, and that's a problem with LTM. So um, it's, I think NBIOT is better adapted for the moment. Good question. Okay. And deep penetration. And deep penetration as well, because it penetrates the buildings in different areas as well. So. I think for the moment, for smart water metering, you're going to you're going to want to focus on NBIOT. Um, there's a question someone pointed out to um, to Elvaco, and I'm not sure if if David Svensson is the right person to answer this, but he said, "Why not use lightweight uh, M2M for meter data transport?" 
Um, I, I, David, are you able to answer that or is that too technical? Um, I, can, I can give an answer. Uh, of okay. course, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe not so detailed, but, but I mean, we did a choice to, to use MPTSN because it is considered as a standard. And this is, this is the same reason that we, we did for lightweight in term with device management. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the short answer, but yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a question here, this always comes up and, and uh, let me repeat it. We are gonna be sharing all these assets as well as selling it, sending out an invitation to our upcoming webinar. So we'll provide all the presentations in a single presentation PDF format, as well as a recording of the video if you wanna share that with your colleagues. Um, maybe maybe I can let me, let me answer the, the yeah, next abso question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I guess that uh, you, 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 mentioned, you, you want to mention that uh, Lightweight N2M uh, allows you to provide uh, selective access uh, for uh, some use cases, uh, which means that uh, you want uh, to be able to uh, uh, change the frequency or refreshment uh, of, uh, of, uh, for a given set of uh, time. For instance, you want to have more information, more data coming up. And yes, like to attempt to permit that uh, to permit to change the, the data cycles uh, uh, refreshment and, and, and you have a full uh, availability to orchestrate data, whether it's data that you use on top of like to attempt to or, or, or that you use like uh, David um, in, in this case uh, over MQDT, you can change the parameters using like to attempt to of, of the data, data access. Is it? Yeah, you can confirm if it if it's my my understanding is correct uh, here, Yeah, it's it's correct. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, uh, just one other thing too. Someone asked. Uh, they had a question about different uh, LP one solutions, and so. Um, Deutsche Telekom uh, came out with a recently came out with a comparison of the different um, different LP1 options out there, uh, a really detailed comparison and talking about what the implications are of, of, of quality of service and lost packets and all these things and uh, and they kind of demystified uh, LP1s I think would be probably the best thing and, and so there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, in part because of marketing people like me, but um, we won't go into that right now. Uh, and I think by and large, that's most of the questions we have today. Uh, there's, let me just check the chat. Oh, the, uh, the link, um, hold on, let me see. I can send the link to everybody on that paper in the chat as well. Very interesting uh, white paper from them as well. And um, with that, I think that's all the questions for today. Good, well, listen, I want to thank everybody uh, again for your time and for participation. And with that, we're going to uh, end the webinar.